Hello, and welcome to our panelists and viewers who are turning in, tuning in from around the world. Thank you for joining us today for this critical conversation on health and human rights in Haiti, specifically through the eyes of the diaspora. My name is Kristen Michaud, and I work at Partners in Health. Today, I will be your moderator and guide throughout this discussion. Partners in Health's vision of health justice and human rights for all began in Haiti more than 30 years ago. As someone who cares deeply about Haiti and called the country home for a few years, I am honored to present this panel of extraordinary Haitian activists from different industries to discuss Haiti's proud and complex history, its challenging present, and the important roles played by the diaspora. Before we begin the discussion, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Wanda Tima, CEO and founder of L'Union Suite, Ancito Etienne, Partners in Health trustee, Gerline Joseph, co-founder and executive director of the Haitian Bridge Alliance, and Jimmy Jean-Louis, actor, producer, and ambassador to the Bargain Core Foundation. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's dive right in. First, let's talk about the role of the diaspora. There are often tensions between Haitians living in Haiti and those living in the diaspora. What is the role of the diaspora? How can we bridge the gap between members of the diaspora and those living locally with daily unrest in the homeland? Gerline, why don't you get us started? Good afternoon and thank you so much, Krista. Thank you for Partners in Health for having us. You know, it is a, a, a good question, but also loaded question um, because we often think that we know what is best for the other. However, I believe as the diaspora, we must take our leadership from the people on the ground who are living the daily unrest, uh, whether it is political unrest, uh, the earthquake and, and other um, crises that we continue to deal with in Haiti and as the Haitian diaspora is really how do we make sure that whatever we do is, is, is in a partnership with those who are the most impacted community members um, uh, on the ground in the motherland. And I say that because, you know, as I am at the US-Mexico border receiving newly arriving migrants and seeing the reality that people are fleeing and I have left the country when I was when I was a uh, uh, very young, oh, it looks like we lost Gerline. While we try to get her back, let's go to you, Jimmy. What thoughts do you have to share on the role of the diaspora? Um, good afternoon, everyone. Very very glad to be part of this. Um, you know, I mean, the word diaspora is, uh, is, is something that is both negative and positive. It depends on how you look at it and where you look at it from. Uh, we can easily say that we're all from the diaspora, you know, whether you hear Americans born here because you, you, you left your continent, Africa, whether it's Haitians living here because they live Haiti. And, uh, and yes, I am part of that group of people who, who was not forced, but uh, deeply encouraged to leave Haiti for the search of a better life. Not me directly, but my parents before me and then me. And, uh, and, and as, as every single Haitian living in Haiti, uh, it seems to be the direction where everybody's going to. They all want to leave Haiti because they think that being outside of Haiti is much better than being in Haiti. So when you know that, when you know the differences between being in Haiti and outside of Haiti, then you kind of try to not, not only understand, sympathize with the people in Haiti and also see how you can potentially help, you know, how you can bridge that gap between uh, us seen as diaspora uh, and, and the Haitians living in Haiti. Uh, well, we play, we play a huge part, you know, in the, in the economy, as you know. Uh, so much money coming from the diaspora go to Haiti, but at the same time, I'm not sure that uh, that money is well used because the number one thing that it creates is that uh, it creates the, you know, it's hard to say, but 
a lot of people just depend on that. Therefore, not real work is being done in the country, meaning by that the economy within the country is not really moving because we have that money that's coming from the diaspora. So now we have to find a way to not just send the money, but send the experience and sort of how to better collaborate with the Haitians in Haiti to better the situation there without necessarily having to give any funds, but really giving them the know-how. And, and, and when I say giving them, it's really collaborating with them, doing the work together and try to, to lesser the difference between the diaspora and the Haitians, really try to become one as, as, as one group of people, which is a hard thing to achieve, but I think that's the direction in which we should we should we should try to go to really have a, a full a full uh, a full relationship and clear relationship between those two sides. Meaning by that, Haitians in Haiti and Haitians outside of Haiti. Great. It looks like we have Gerlene back. Um, did you want to finish your response to that question, Gerlene? I, I think that uh, Brother Jimmy picked up and, and definitely, um, you know. It, answered that. And, you know, I just want to add that the reality is, um, I believe, as we see um, Haiti exporting, you know, amazing brands, amazing communities, young people, young men and women who are fighting for justice, who are creating change, and at the same time seeing Haiti importing more violence and, and things like that, really see how the Haitian diaspora as Jimmy mentioned, can really collaborate and work with the people in Haiti to create the change that we know we can bring to our homeland. Great. Wanda, do you have anything to add? Yes. Um, first, thank you, Partners in Health. Thank you, Krista, for having me here today. I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. And to add on to what my sister Gerlene said and brother Jimmy said, is pretty much for me one of the biggest ways that I think we can bridge the gap as someone that literally started a platform where our slogan and logo is bridging the um, gap between Asians and Haiti and the diaspora. I think one of the biggest things is communication, like making sure like we are creating a dialogue, like earlier you say, a partnership dialogue into what's going on. A lot of times as a diaspora, we're, we're ready to go. We have that you know, motivation of it's time to go, let's act, let's do, this is what needs to be done, this is how it should be done. And a lot of times we're doing that based on, you know, the way we live here. And there's not a lot of dialogue between our sisters and brothers on the ground on exactly what they need help with, what direction we should go, what is the best ways to help. And you look at that in situations, for example, like the earthquake in the South, Many times we think we know, we think we know what to do. Let's start collecting goods. Let's send them here. Let's do this here. But there's not a, enough dialogue with the people that are there on the ground that knows the rural areas that know better than us to where it's like, what do you need? What do you say, think is the first step? What is the you know first direction you'd like for us to go? And how can we amplify your voices, amplify the work that you're already doing? Because another thing that normally happens too, because of the lack of communication between the two, is there's this idea that the people on the ground are not working they're not doing it's like we're just coming in to just be saviors and just help out but there is people on the ground there's organizations there's other young people like myself that's actually doing things but we're not communicating it's not enough dialogue happening between us for us to work um collectively yeah those are really great points thank you for that and Sito how do you think we can bridge the gap between members of the diaspora and those living in Haiti Great. Uh, hi, Krista. Nice to see you. Nice to see everyone in the panel. And thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, well, this is a very, very important question. It's one that I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, and uh, full disclosure, I find it very hard sometimes to call myself uh, a member of the diaspora because I spend so much time thinking about Haiti and reflecting on the situation happening there. But um, you know, I, I do think that I have something to contribute to the conversation. So let me start there. Um, in terms of uh, diasporas, and I think our viewers uh, and listeners uh, would benefit a lot from learning a little bit about how diasporas uh, emerge, uh, how they are created, right? Uh, because all countries have diasporas. Uh, uh, 
it's it's a big world and folks uh, sometimes feel more comfortable, uh, you know, living in a country that's not necessarily their native land. But the countries that tend to have bigger diasporas, they are countries that usually have experienced a lot of instability and insecurity. Um, in the case of Haiti, our diaspora, uh, I think, at least uh, for me, reminds me of darker or dark times in Haiti, because every single time we see a rise in the Haitian diaspora, it's usually due to political instability, uh, natural and unnatural disasters. So it's very important to think about the the events that uh, contribute to creating and increasing a diaspora. Uh, And these events have a very important part to play in the conversation as well. Uh, For example, uh, during my time here in the US, I have met a lot of people that I probably would not have had the chance to meet if I were in Haiti uh, by people I mean Haitians who live in the in the US. And a lot of these Haitians, they left the country during the Duvalier era, the dictatorship that occurred in Haiti. Um, I think around the 1970s uh, to 1986, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of Duvalier uh, uh, dynasty. Uh, a, a lot of the folks, uh, that I've met, some have left before, uh, well, during the dictatorship because they were being persecuted, uh, uh, politically persecuted. And after the uh, the uh, regime was overthrown, a lot of other folks also were supporters of the regime have also left. And those two groups now are part of the diaspora and that creates some friction as well. So how do you organize uh, a diaspora that, uh, just naturally uh, has a dynamic that is very complicated and how you organize it to communicate and help the, the, the model it. So that is a very important issue that we have to sort of uh, understand uh, that the diaspora itself needs a bit of uh, organization, of unionization, and also um, a bit of a plan to, to help the country. So in terms of helping and how to engage the diaspora, uh, in you know having in mind this context of how events uh, make it very difficult uh, to, to to create this this uh, organization and synchronization, I think there are a couple ways uh, the the Haitian diaspora can contribute. The first uh, I'm thinking here in terms of short and as well as long term. So in the short term, there are a couple ways I think the the Haitian diaspora can, and I think. Uh, so two two ways in particular. The first is to uh, support relatives that they have in Haiti, which I think the Haitian diaspora is doing a fabulous job of. Right, uh, last year Haiti contributed about thirty eight percent of uh, well the the uh, remittance they said to Haiti was about 38% of GDP. That's a huge amount, right? And it's it's just one of the top, remi- Haitian diaspora is one of the top remitters in the world, top five, right? Uh, but in terms of, in other way, I think the, the Haitian diaspora can support, and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about it because I'm so involved in, in different uh, nonprofits, uh, is by helping uh, international and local entities doing great work in the country. I understand that not everyone in the Haitian diaspora needs to start, uh, you know, a nonprofit or can actually leave their job and go to the country and help each family that's in need. But they are institutions that have uh, a great track record of delivering good results that they can support. Uh, and I also would be remiss if I didn't talk about, uh, you know, this the organization that is holding this panel, Partners in Health, and their great track record in, in the country. That's one of the uh, organizations uh, that uh, I think the Haitian diaspora could definitely support in helping with the econo- economic development and long-term development in the country. In, in terms of, uh, I just have w- one last thing to add in, in terms of long-term development, there are a few ways that I think the diaspora could help, but I don't think it's necessarily um, been sort of, the, the agenda and the strategy for that has necessarily been built. I think uh, in terms of trade, entrepreneurship, and movement of skills and know-how, which Jimmy talked about earlier, that's an important uh, uh, sort of set of assets and resources that the Haitian diaspora has that's not actually being used currently. And I know that there is there is a ministry of Haitians living abroad that, that's in, in Haiti, but I actually don't 
quite know what they have been doing really to uh, take advantage of the huge resources that the diaspora uh, has. So I'm really hoping that in the future, that is something that can be done to make sure us living abroad uh, can actually contribute in real time. Now, each of you have touched on this next question um, a little bit, and it's all about remittances, of course. Um, remittances to Haiti have risen for several years in a row. In 2018, it was about 3.1 billion, 3.3 billion in 2019, and 3.8 billion is what the diaspora sent back to Haiti in 2020, a record high. The diaspora is the largest investor in Haiti. What are important and productive ways to put remittances to use? And Wanda, we'll start with you. Thank you, Krista. Um, yes, this question is always one that, you know, whether we're talking about it on the panel or behind the scenes and the great debates in rooms um, with the diaspora, I'm always just like, uh, you know, what direction do you go with? This. So I want to start off by saying exactly what Gurley said earlier, always making sure that I am very well aware we are not always the best people as diasporas to make a decision on where money should go when it comes to um, you know, our brothers and sisters in Haiti. But I also think like one of the things that would be great is like, for example, these, some of these transfer fees and so on that you know we pay for some of this stuff. If there was a system set up in some kind of way to where you can, you can select like a preference of where you would want like the fees for your mittens or so, however to go to, whether it be in education and health environment or, you know, something of that sort, whatever percentage of it, you know, can go into that. Because I think right now it's like, it's kind of hard to have the conversation of, you know, the most productive ways for it to be used because a lot of our family members back home are using this money just to stay above the poverty line. Like they, they it's not really much you can do with the money being sent if people aren't working, the economy is bad, political unrest, there's all this stuff going on to where they're using the remittance that's going home to barely, to feed themselves and to stay alive in the country and, and you know, feed their children, try to send their, their children to school on days where there actually is school. So I, I think it's kind of hard to say, okay, let's talk about all these ways to where it can, you know, where the remittance can go with, in, with the state of the country and the things that's going on. But if it, in a perfect world, you know, if things were better in Haiti, it would be great to see it go through to the environment, the economy and ways of like the healthcare sector, for example, to where there's services set up, dental, healthcare, where, you know, our families could use some of the money into these areas, educational services, after school program, resource centers and stuff for, um, for you know, for children. There's nothing really set up by the people that's there you know, to, for our families to do anything with remittance, but feed themselves, you know, and, and, and help out in however way they can with other families in the area. So there are a lot of ways and a lot of things that we can do with these. I just don't think it's a fair conversation, especially for the diaspora to answer right now, where there's not that much options. Yeah, and I think you also make a really good point about um, a lot of remittances being used just to meet daily needs that, that people have. Um, Jimmy, Jimmy, we'd love to hear from, from you next. Um, what do you think are some important and productive ways to put remittances to use? Um, I, think, I think we should uh, potentially give a bigger space to the Haitian diaspora within the country. Uh, maybe have a full inclusion of those of the diaspora, potentially allow them to be part of the political arena, just so they can be part of that real conversation that change things. Uh, yeah, maybe a section of that money can can be allocated to create a group that could potentially have a real voice within the country, because the voice of the diaspora is is extremely important, and we do have a bunch of professionals that would love to to go to Haiti and, 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 and collaborate, as, as we all said, uh, with the Haitians. But, but for that, they need to, to feel completely included uh, in, in, in the space, in the Haitian space. So, so yes, I would definitely favor for, for a more inclusive uh, diaspora in Haiti. Great. And Sito, anything to add? Of course, I love to talk about remittances. Uh, well, 
there are a couple of things that I like about remittances that I think I should mention. Um, I, I, at least three things, actually. The first is that uh, remittances are very different from foreign direct investment, which is uh, a, which is a, a very important point because when it comes to uh, a economic development of a third or let's say low-income countries like Haiti, foreign direct investment is usually what uh, people discuss, what, uh, what uh, uh, is usually included in big debates. But I love remittances. Uh, I think the first reason is because they tend to act as some sort of insurance plan that uh, people and relatives that uh, the, the diaspora uh, has in their native land can count on during very difficult times. Um, in, that's a good thing because unlike foreign direct investment that actually does not flow in during hard times, remittances actually increase during hard times. Uh, this may be slightly different during COVID because it's a global pandemic, so everyone is affected by it. But naturally, uh, in 2010, when the earthquake happened in Haiti, billions uh, flew in from uh, in terms of remittances into the country. Uh, mm. Every single time we see a natural disaster in the country, uh, a lot of remittances is going. Um, is, is secondly, I actually think uh, re- remittances actually contribute at a greater level to uh, economic development in the country than uh, things like foreign direct investment. The reason is because uh, for, for actually the same reasons that Wanda mentioned earlier, that the people that tend to re- receive remittances, they all... Uh, poor people, they are people that actually uh, need to spend their money right away. They need it for food, for basic necessities. And that's great for an economy because uh, the people that have AI propensity to, a marginal propensity to spend, uh, a, a spend their money as soon as they receive it. And that, that because of the money multiplier in economic terms, and I'm sorry if I'm speaking a, a jargon for some of you listening and watching, but that contributes uh, at a faster rate to economic development in the country. So uh, it, it wouldn't be uh, unfair to say that remittances are really the backbone of the Haitian economy uh, uh, right now. The, the great other thing about remittances that I like is that they don't have to go through bureaucratic uh, uh, entities in order to get there, right? You want to send some money now, you t- pick up your phone or go to a store, send the money, it gets there right away. And that's a great thing because during disasters, the last thing you want to have to, uh, to do if you're a poor person is to sort of like have to listen to big organizations saying, oh, we, we don't know if you deserve this $10 that we could give you, right? But a family member would ev- quickly go in and spend that money right away. So in terms of ways that remittances can be spent more productively, besides sort of, uh, I guess, uh, helping to take care of basic necessities, uh, we have a very young population, right? This is the greatest, I think, asset that Haiti has now. It's 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 your young population. And I don't think they, uh, the folks in the diaspora, even the folks in, in the finance or business industry are really taking advantage of that huge resource the country has. So I think uh, with better organization, uh, it could be the case that uh, remittances or on that uh only sent just to take basic care uh, of necessities, but also to uh, build businesses, drive entrepreneurship in the country that could really give the youth jobs. And by giving them jobs, you're really uh, creating, making sure that uh, the country doesn't have to rely as much uh, on remittances. 38% of its GDP doesn't have to uh, to come from, from remittances, right? In terms of education, we still have a huge way to go, right? Uh, education is basically being financed by now by the Haitian diaspora. Uh, if uh, For all of you watching and listening, you know that the Haitian government a, a while ago, I believe in 2015, uh, a, um, imposed a $1.5 tax on every a, a transfer that goes to Haiti. So that money... Uh, it, it, there's, you know, there is a lot of critici- uh, criticism around how it's spent, whether it's spent legally, whether there is enough transparency around it. But what's important is that the diaspora is funding education in Haiti. 
And I think uh, it can be done at a greater level. I think right now only primary education is being is being uh, uh, sponsored by by this tax. And I think uh, higher education needs to be to be uh, to receive some of of that money as well. And if we organize well, we we make sure that our voice is heard. I'm sure that. Uh, the, the government of Haiti would have no other option than to listen to what we have to do, to say. Healthcare is another huge problem that they, they, um, the diaspora can finance. And I hope that folks in the diaspora can get very creative about how the diaspora itself can finance. I've heard of certain groups that are trying to make it possible for uh, folks in the diaspora to be able to pay for, for example, for healthcare or for their relatives. I think uh, these are great ideas and I'd love to see them being, I'd love to see the words being uh, spread uh, about how they can be used and, and, and how the diaspora can greater uh, contribute. Um, I know I, I keep taking longer than I should, Krista, but I'm just so excited about these topics. Well, thank you so much, Ancito. Um, Gerlene, let's bring you into this topic. What is your What are your thoughts on remittances and, and putting them to better use from um, members of the diaspora? I think so much has been shared uh, um, already, but one thing that I'm really looking into is, is durable infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure in the country. Uh, for example, during the last earthquake that happened, what we at the Haitian Alliance did is that we reached out to people on the ground and we started a cash assistance for the people who were impacted. So what we did, as Encito mentioned, we sent a transfer to the person who we know that they just lost everything, including their families. And with that money, they chose to bury their families, be able to get tents, to get food in a dignified way, or be able to move to a safer area. But at the end of the day, if we don't have, if we don't have sustainable structures, where those things happen and we have hospitals and schools and roads that are, that are able to, um, to allow the, the flow of, of, of um, movement, uh, we will continue the same issues. So what I'm thinking is, as um, Encito mentioned, the $1.50 that is being sent to Haiti, those will should be a part of building a sustainable system where Haiti can, can actually stand on its feet when, and not if, but when we have the next earthquake, when we have the next disaster, when we have the next political or continued political turmoil that we know there is there's sustainability for the people on the ground. So that's why I think that it's not just sending the money because one thing I always say, is that we send the money to a family member, to a person, but at the end of the day, it is not enough for the country to be able to move forward in a sustainable way. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that um, you, Wanda, Gerlene, and Encito all sort of touched upon something, um, you know, with the tax or remittances of $1.50 um, and that going to education and there being some controversy around how that was spent. But maybe there's another option where people are able to sort of decide um, how they want to invest that funding and look at some sort of transparent and accountable way um, to, to track where all of that is, is going. So that sounds like, you know, it could possibly possibly be an actionable um, solution or for putting remittances to better use. Um, let's go to the next question. Um, current events like the deportation of migrants, fuel shortages, which have been plaguing the country for weeks in particular, the ongoing pandemic and years of political unrest constantly overshadow Haiti's growth and progress. What empowers you to fight for change in Haiti and continue pushing for justice? Jimmy, would you like to go first? Um, yes, sure. Uh, well, in my case, it's it's just a personal affair. You know, obviously, I'm born in Haiti, I'm, I'm very much Haitian, uh, but I've been I've been I've been impacted by by being an immigrant myself. You know, first time where I really realized that I was not just black, but, uh, but I was also Haitian. It was going to school in, in, in Paris. You know, I was probably 13 or 14 when there was a time where my school was going from, in, from, from France to, to England. And in that year, because of, uh, of, uh, of AIDS, 
out of all the kids that were going to England, I was the only one that was asked to do, to do an AIDS test. So straight away, I knew I was Haitian. And, and with that, you're like, I'm like, okay, uh, what am I going to do with that? Let me, let me recognize who I am and, and move with that. Second big event was a meeting with uh, Nelson Mandela, president of, uh, of South Africa. That was back in 94. And by meeting Mr. Mandela, we had a great conversation, basically about Haiti and about the Haitian revolution. So I was a youngster and now I'm having affirmation from someone such as Nelson Mandela, which then gives me pride about who I am. So I continue with my journey, you know, lived uh, in many parts of the world and ended up in, in LA. And as an actor, uh, I've also had a chance to not just be the Haitian and heroes, but also to play Toussaint Louverture. So it's a lot of mini events that led me to recognize and appreciate that, yes, number one, I am Haitian and I absolutely embrace the fact that I'm Haitian. Uh, when the earthquake in 2010 happened, you know, I was in Haiti like the day after. And, uh, and, and I was so moved by it that I tried to do whatever I could to help the country as everybody did. And as you all know now, we all failed. We all felt terribly. Uh, moving forward 10 years from, from, from then, uh, we still are failing, you know. Uh, whenever there's a big event, as we, we saw what happened in El Paso between the Mexican border and the American border, the treatment of the migrants uh, being whipped, of course, it touches us. We react straight away, and then uh, the actions are not, strong enough to, to, to change the course of the situation. Uh, obviously, there is, a, there is a real will to change that. There's a real will to put all our energy and strength into better the Haitian cause. That's why we're here. Uh, and that's why I still uh, remain, you know, I'm still present for all those big action because I truly believe that Haiti can come out of it. Uh, and, and, and to answer your question, it's all those things that give me the strength, you know, to keep fighting because I believe in a better Haiti. I believe that uh, Haiti was uh, one of the greatest nations to 200 years ago, being the first Black Republic to fight and win the independence. I believe that Haiti can become again one of the greatest nations by getting the right people in the right positions and pushing the right agendas. Uh, will it happen in my lifetime? I believe so. And, uh, and I will do whatever I can, you know, to keep, uh, to keep pushing towards that. that. That is really great. Thank you so much, Jimmy, for, for sharing that. Um, and Sito, what about you? What keeps you em empowered and inspired? Oh my, uh, so many, so many things. Uh, but let me highlight to uh, Krista. Uh, so the first, I think it's it's simply uh, an emotional connection, right? Uh, I love Haiti and I miss Haiti. Uh, I have been living in the U.S. for the past eight years, and I every year uh, I look forward to to being there. Um, I um, am based out of, of I, I, I live in, in, in Boston, but I'm, I'm joining now from, from Brooklyn, uh, work duties. Um, and it's 50 degrees outside. Uh, and I remember when I was uh, in Haiti, uh, it was 70, 80, 90 degrees every day. And, and I used to sunbathe all the time, but uh, I miss those days, and and I think in terms of the emotional connection, I cannot wait uh, to be back to, to, uh, to to where I was born, uh, to where my family still lives, uh, and to where my friends are. Uh, the second is is a psychological and, and visceral distress uh, that uh, events uh, that I see on TV happening in Haiti and two Haitians abroad uh, uh, always. Um, 
uh, I guess in a way affect me. Um, when I was when I was uh, in Haiti, uh, I as a as a as an adolescent, as a young person, and and now uh, as I guess uh, adult, uh, I um, really had a great time and uh, been inspired by our history, which Jimmy just mentioned, right? Being the first uh, uh, Black Republic, being a nation that was able to dream something at the time that transcended transcended time and space, uh, that was really inspiring to me. But in recent years, what I've seen in uh, the news uh, is uh, just a very incorrect uh, portrayal of what Haiti is, right? The words that are used to describe Haiti are uh, often wrong, uh, you know, it's usually described as a poor, uh, as a fair state, uh, as a um, uh, the, the most uh, poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, all along, right? Haiti, and, and, and often as a violent state too, and uh, probably it's very important to mention that now that they are, uh, there's a lot of gang violence in the country and the rise of ki- and kidnappings and all of that. So, you know, I actually want to also take this time to to correct some of those adjectives that, that are often wrong, right? Haiti is not a poor country, it's an impoverished country. And I think we have to realize that it's, uh, it, it became poor because there was not an accidental, but a, a, um, an intentional process for making it poor, right? Um, Haiti is not a failed state. It's a state that is in the process of becoming what it or was always meant to be, a safe haven for all people, Black people in particular, from around the world. Haiti is not uh, a violent uh, country. It's a Haitians or, or a people that uh, are very proud and, and a people that have learned over over decades and centuries that in order for their sovereignty and their human rights to be respected, they have to fight for it. So um, I was always uh, inspired by that history uh, in uh and that's one of the reasons that I'm always uh, so, uh, I guess, zealous in, wow. in advocating for change, uh, not just in Haiti, but also for all Haitians, uh, wherever they live around the world. Caroline, you recently received the RFK Human Rights Award. Congratulations. It was very well deserved. And you see a lot um, at the border with the work that you do. How do you stay motivated? Uh, Thank you so much uh, um, again. You know, being the only Black-led organization, the only Haitian organization at the U.S.-Mexico border, providing humanitarian assistance, legal services, social services, and literally fighting to change the policies that are impacted all immigrants, but particularly Black immigrants. And what we said is that in 2015, we went to the US-Mexico border for the Haitians, but we found people from Cameroon, from Mauritania, literally from around the world. And we, as leaders of freedom, leaders of liberation, we decided to not only stay for the Haitians, but we stayed for everyone we found at the U.S.-Mexico border. So what keeps me going is the 30 women that we highlighted on our uh, Journey of Hope report uh, just before the, the pandemic, 30 Haitian women who actually were survivors of the earthquake who made the journey to Brazil and then made the journey to the to the US Mexico border the stories that they shared was only based on hope a hope that they will find a home shashi lavi right and though and then we see young people in Haiti that are continuing to fight to make sure that they don't have to flee home but we still see the reality that when home is the mouth of a shark and and, and again my brother in Cito mentioned all of those but the reality is we are living in a time where violence is, 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 is what we hear of every day in Haiti. And what I say is that I, my, my hope that 1804 that was possible can one again be possible so that we can not only have the freedom of, 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 um, of our bodies, 
but the freedom of our minds because we clearly understand how mental slavery is still very prevalent in our communities. How do we make how do we make sure that we break the chains of mental slavery where young people can really take responsibility for the next step in our history. So that's what keeps me going, even when, as we saw under the bridge, and what I tell people, I was the only one under the bridge. And I saw those 14,000 people that we were talking about, I saw them. And I saw them and I saw myself in them. And I saw those 14,000 faces, not only 14,000 faces there, but I saw 14,000 girlings standing under the bridge. So as I was looking at myself in the faces of those 14,000 people, I said the hope that I saw that was overpowering the desperation and the conditions of our people. So that's what keeps me going when one little children or little black boys, little black girls in the face of what we witnessed, but they were still prideful. And even when people are asking what happened to those 14,000 people, two did as of Friday, over 9,000 of them were deported to Haiti. 82 flights to Haiti under President Biden using a racist and cruel system to bring to bring people of Haitian descent into Haiti right now. Yes, we see the hope, but at the same time, we must be realistic and say as the diaspora, how do we make sure that we work with the people in Haiti to create a sustainable society for us to move forward? So hope is what keeps me going. The hope that I saw under the bridge, the hope that I continue to hear in the voices of the little black girls and the black boys, the voices, the hope that I, I know from, from Wanda, the hope that I hear from Jimmy and Ancito and all the people on this panel, that's what keeps me going. Thank you so much. And Wanda, let's go to, to you. Um, I happen to follow Lunyo and Sweet, as I'm sure everybody um, who's on this panel and watching does. And, you know, I know that you share um, a lot of information about what's going on um, with the Haitian community, not only in the United States, but in Haiti and around the world. How do you stay motivated and what keeps you fighting, even on the days where you may feel frustrated or, or tired or disheartened? Thank you, Krista. Um, a lot of what everyone else here have already said, um, but number one, of course, because I am Haitian, but for a very long time growing up, I grew up, you know, more Haitian American than anything growing up from Turks and Caicos to South Florida. I didn't really know much of what that meant, except for just having the title of being, you know, Haitian hyphen. And I didn't know much about my history. I wasn't connected to the community. I, you know, I didn't go to Haiti um, in summer vacations like some of my friends now did. So the experience for me was so different growing up um, in South Florida. And in 2011, I started the Sleep as a passion project for myself. I was trying to find find out who I was, find out more about my history and my ancestors, where I come from. What does that mean? Because of course, at that time, you could the you couldn't find much online, um, especially you're talking about 2011. It was a lot of earthquake and charity work and disaster. There wasn't a, any, not any, but not a lot of positive content, positive news, positive information coming, um, you know, or being posted about the country in, in the media space. And I couldn't find the things that I was looking for. And this, you know, passion project for me ended up being something that I wasn't even aware of so many other you know, Haitian hyphens also felt disconnected, Haitians around the world that also didn't have a way back into Haiti, didn't know what's going on, wasn't aware of all the beautiful beaches and the scenery, know like, hey, we're the first Black Free Republic, but that's all. Like, don't, didn't know further than that what that meant. And for the last 10 years, I've been able to help bridge that gap and also share and continue to share daily that we're a melting pot of people. We're not just we're not just the poorest this and the poorest that. We're not just, you know, the 15 or 30 second clips you see on CNN and these other media platforms where something is going on and it trends for a week or two and then it disappears. 
you know, we're more than that. Like, yes, we have all these things going on in our country, but we have people like Gurleen, like she said, that's on the ground doing the work. There's entertainment figures like Jimmy that is Haitian, that's, you know, winning awards and doing the things that he's doing. A lot of times when people talk about Haitian, you're only hearing the negative. You have everyday heroes, everyday Haitians that's breaking records, making history in all these different areas. And a lot of times, because it doesn't say Haitian, it just says Black, a lot of people don't know these are our our people, like these are people that grew up in, you know, small towns and rural towns in Haiti that have gone on, immigrants that's gone on to do these amazing things. And I feel like that's, it's become my responsibility to make sure that we are forever, not just saying we're black this, we're black that, but what that means. We're keeping the information in the media. You know, we're sharing the everyday stories. We're sharing the community stories. I've had the pleasure of being able to go to Haiti to help on the ground and sit right here behind my screen and help her lean from right here where I am by just sharing information with me and amplifying her voice when she can't, cause she's on the ground. And that's what, that what keeps, that's what keeps me going because it's not about me. It started, it started out as something that was for me but it's no longer just about me. Like people would like to make you think that the only kind of information people care about when it comes to Haiti is political, you know, uh, unrest and, and stories of that sort. But that's not true because I sit here every single day and we do not ever drop under two, three, four million people on our platforms daily. And they're engaging and they connect. You know, we're here to educate people on what Title 42 is and why it's no good. And we're also here to share your favorite celebrities, your, your favorite sports, um, you know, figures and what they're doing. We will go through 10 different areas of what it's like being Haitian in one day. And people need that. They need a place to connect. They need a place to galvanize. They need a place, you know, to where we can amplify our voices. Because a lot of us, sometimes we're helpless. We can't do anything. So sharing a message, sharing a tweet, sharing a historical, you know, clip that goes on beyond just the Haitian community, those, seeing those things and being able to see, you know, like our graduate posts about all these young Haitians that say they didn't know this and that about Haiti. Now they know this. They want to go back. They want to help. They join these organizations. You know, that's important. Groups like yourself, Partners in Help. A lot of times people don't know you guys exist. They don't know the work that's being done. They don't see the things happening on the ground. You have these amazing organizations. Their sole responsibility is to work and make sure that they're getting this stuff done. They're not thinking a lot of times, making sure like the work, the images, the photos are being shared. So you get a lot of the images from other people going viral and so on, but your people aren't seeing the work that you're doing on the ground. They don't know how many Haitians you're helping. They don't know how many, you know, diasporas have left home just to be on the ground with you guys. And that's what we come in. And like they say, with, with influence come great responsibility. And we're going to continue to do that and champion and amplify all of our Haitians around the world. That's awesome. Um, I, I can't believe the time has passed so quickly. We are at our final question. And, and Cito, I'm going to start with you on this one. Information overload has increased during the pandemic. I know that I have done quite a bit of doom scrolling myself. While many people are fatigued from screens, news cycles, misinformation is also spreading throughout the diaspora. I'm sure we're all part of some sort of WhatsApp group where that happens. What do you wish people, more people knew about Haiti? Oh, that's such a beautiful question, uh, Krista, because uh, there is just so much that I would like uh, folks to know about Haiti. Uh, but let me... Um, just, just share two uh, right now that I think of uh, very important given the current situation in Haiti. The first is uh, the price uh, that uh, Haiti was forced to pay for its independence and the legacy of that injustice. Uh, and the second uh, are the non-accidental events by foreign actors that have uh, caused and that just influence uh, Haiti's uh, current situation. Um, Haiti was supposed to be, as I mentioned before, a safe haven for, for again, all people, Black people, uh, to seek refuge uh, whenever they were being persecuted uh, and, and whether they are affected by, by disasters. Um, but uh, in what's important and, and very interesting is that I don't think our ancestors ever imagined that today Haitians would be uh, seeking refuge in other lands, right? Uh, Gerlin was uh, telling us about all the work that she's been doing. Like our ancestors could, if they were hearing that today, they would not even comprehend it. That's that's not the country that they had uh, built and, and uh, left behind for us. 
So uh, to me, g- given all this context, uh, what I would like folks to know is that Haiti is in the process of becoming what it's always meant to be. Uh, it's a country that is uh, seeing a lot of hard times, but those hard times are only giving us data that eventually will help us to make better decisions. Obviously, uh, Haiti has been the victim of countless injustices, uh, deceptive manipulation, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, I think these injustices, uh, folks in uh, foreign governments and foreign entities need to to be held accountable. Case in point, uh, after Haiti's independence, uh, France uh, forced Haiti to pay what today is equivalent to $30 billion. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a lot of money that has crippled the Haitian economy since uh, the start of repayment in 1825 that ended in 1947. That's, that's a very long period of time to be repaying uh, for, uh, for losses during a war, which sounds very silly to me. Uh, because it was a, a revolutionary war, an independence war. And uh, I, France, in terms of holding uh, actors, foreign actors accountable, uh, France doesn't just owe us a moral debt. They owe us $30 billion that they need to repay. And that money would definitely help a lot right now. Uh, the second thing is just the, the non-accidental events, right? Haiti, again, uh, is in the process of becoming what it's always meant to be. But there's been a lot of events that have made it very difficult for them to achieve that, right? For example, Haiti's sovereignty has always been undermined by governments like the United States government, right? Uh, every time the U.S. goes into Haiti to try to stabilize they create more destabilization. <laughs> and that's not accidental. That is, that is intentional. It, it's it's uh, worth noting that uh, Haiti is one of the country in which the US has had the longest uh, time working with governments. They're working in, in courts, right? So I think it's very important to, for folks to remember that, uh, again, Haiti isn't poor, it's impoverished, and there is, uh, the, it has $30 billion that still owed to it. Haiti, uh, its government is incapacitated, but it can be if foreign actors give them the sovereignty and the, the, the power that they need to make those decisions themselves. Eventually, we will get, we will become the peel of the Antilles that we once was and uh, that we are striving to, to, to become again. So I do hope folks uh, think about uh, this historical context when they think about Haiti and Haitians that uh, live abroad. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, Ancito. Gerlene, what do you wish more people knew about Haiti? Uh, I think as Ancito mentioned, you know, <laughs> it's interesting when, when I encounter people from the Caribbean or even the U.S., they have absolutely no idea even where Haiti is located, um, you know, to go into the history, as Encito mentioned. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that, what it means, uh, what Haiti itself means, and, and, and the very um, existence of Haiti being unacceptable to the West, to the United States, to friends and the powers uh, um, at large. But, you know, I, I think um, what I would like people to always remember is that, that hey, Haiti, Haiti is, is beautiful, Haiti is strong, Haiti um, is powerful. That's why they continue to make sure our existence uh, um, is, is, is muted. Um, that 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 we 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 are proud and we we are strong and we'll continue to fight as as leaders of liberation for all people, and I think also I would love for people to to connect um, uh, uh, the work that being done on the ground by by the young men and young women who many lives have been lost, but but people that are continuing to fight uh, even when doesn't seem to be to be any hope. And, and, you know, um, as uh, we continue to provide and, and be in this fight um, at the U.S.-Mexico border in creating systematic changes in the United States, I think that um, we need to, to, to continue um, 
to create those spaces and continue to lead in that way and making sure that the voices of the Haitian community is not silenced, um, that the realities of continue uh, to make sure safe and protected. And what I say is that we stand against all violence. We stand against uh, internal violence that makes it impossible for, for Haiti to, to, to thrive. We don't want to survive, we want to thrive. And we stand against the, the uh, external violence as in situ mentioned from all the other countries such as the United States and France and, and, and Mexico. Um, as well. So my hope is that we'll continue to push through no matter what. And as I said before, 1804 should not be erased, cannot be erased. And, and we are moving forward to creating uh, a space where our people can thrive uh, in, into the future. Thank you. So I also want to mention that, that here in the United States, we have uh, um, you know, the Haitian American elected officials to show you how the, current, the the diaspora is creating power, real power as well. Over 86 current members of local elected officials fighting for the community and creating change. How can we come together as a people in the diaspora and in Haiti to elect people that 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 can create policies for the betterment of all? Yeah, the advocacy and, and policy piece is, is really important. Um, Wanda, what do you want our viewers to know um, about Haiti? Um, pretty much everything that I just want to echo what they just said, what Gerlene, um just said. And in addition, you know, to these things, like and Cito mentioned the historical, you know, context of Haiti, just what I mentioned earlier, the fact that yes, it's good to know these little, you know, sound bites and these little one-liners of what Haiti is, but diving into the history of Haiti, like who we were, when you say the Pearl of the Antilles, what did, what does that mean? People hear that a lot of times, but what does that mean when Haiti was flourishing, what it was like to vacation, some of your favorite people vacationed, you know, and honeymoon in Haiti. Haiti is not, wasn't always, you know, what you see right now. Yes, we, you know, People use the headline, the poorest, the poorest, the poorest, but why? Why is there not enough conversation about why, you know, Haiti is the poorest? You know, these experts that many times are speaking for us, many times are not our experts. They're not the ones that are back and forth in the country that's on the ground. A lot of these media platforms, so on, are picking people that they know or that's tied to Haitians in some way. They're not normally the correct voices for us and exactly what's going on. So making sure like there's not enough of us at the tables to where we should be at the tables. And there are a lot of us working, you know, there are a lot of organizations, people doing things. We don't always have the best assistance. So a lot of times we don't have the best marketing strategies and we don't have the best this and that to make sure this information is going out. So because you're not seeing it, it doesn't mean it's not happening. You're just not looking in the right place, like being a little bit more diligent about doing your research on who's doing what. A lot of times like people are like, oh, I had no idea, you know, there was a platform like Lean Your Sweep. You'd literally type in Haitians or Haiti on Google, we come up. People many times are not doing, you know, these research. Some of these people on Twitter that's speaking are not experts. These tweets that's going viral are not always coming, you know, from the people that should be speaking, you know, on our behalf. So I really wish people understand, like, yes, there's, you know, with everything that's been going on in Haiti, Haiti still is a massively beautiful country. We do want the best for our country. We are working. We're not just sitting back and waiting, you know, for somebody to save us. But there is a lot. Of, there is a lot of interfering by the U.S. and a lot of people that shouldn't be interfering. And we are tired too. Like you know, we see all these messages where people are like, "Well, Haitians are not doing anything." Yes, we are. You know, but we also need assistance and outside, you know, sources that have the powers that be to amplify our voices and our projects and the things, you know, that um, are happening at home. So for me, I just really wish people would just be a little bit more diligent about really checking in with the Haitian community and where we are, instead of just jumping on the first source that people tell people to go to or just listening to where the media tell us you should be. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy, we'll let you have the, the final word here. Um, what do you wish more people knew about Haiti? Um, a few things. Um, first of all, Haiti was the strongest economy 
in the Caribbean 200 years ago. Second of all, Haiti was occupied by America for 20 years after the death of a president in 1915. Third of all, without the vote of Haiti, there wouldn't be Israel. It would still be Palestine. And fourth of all, every single America should have a glass of rum. Babonku, of course. I I a hundred percent agree with that. <laughs> Actually, uh, I had to buy something from it. It's in Haiti right now. And yeah, but, but no, no, uh, uh, no, actually, there is another point that I wanted to make. Uh, I know it's been said many times, but some people still don't know about that. Louisiana, which was a third of, um, which was a third of America back then, would still be French if it wasn't because of the Haitian Revolution. Louisiana would not be part of America. So I think all Americans should know about that. Jimmy, I have I have the babaco for you. Ah, yes, I. She didn't brush she pam not do my poor way. Oh my goodness. I mean, should we all go and get our <laughs> Let me just pour a cup for the rest of us that don't have a bottle right now. <laughs> no, it's, it's a little hard to, to come by when you can't make the stop at duty free and, and get your case, your mallet on the way um, out of, of Haiti. Okay, Jimmy's back with his. Oh. Oh, uh -huh. oh that's the VIP bottle. Yeah. years. 150 years. Okay, you you know you know I'm in Orange County, so <laughs> I meant to say Jimmy pour us all a glass. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you to our panelists and Cito Etienne, Gerline Joseph, Wanda Tima, and Jimmy Jean Louis. What a powerful and illuminating discussion. We appreciate the time you have taken to be with us today and to all of our partners, the Haitian Bridge Alliance. Barbancourt Foundation and Nunyan Suite. Thank you for lending your platforms and voices for this discussion. To learn more, visit PIH.org or any of our human rights and advocacy partners listed below. Thank you so much for joining us.